there, Ron. There we go. Can I hear you now? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Good. You know, uh, I'd like to ask you a question. What about your Christian experience do you find one of the most pleasing thoughts? What do you appreciate about being a Christian more than, than you might think? Anybody have anything that comes to mind? Yes. Being secure in God's hand. Being secure in God's hand. Okay, great. Somebody else. Yes. Jesus came He what? Jesus. I know Jesus. You know the Lord. You know Jesus Christ. Okay, great. Is there anybody else? Yes, ma'am. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. Okay, these are certainly uh, wonderful things, aren't they? You know, uh, several years ago, I asked a, an adult class in Colorado where I was teaching uh, that same question. And, and, of course, a number of them said, well, there's no hell. I don't have to go to hell. And, of course, that's, hey, that's monumental. But it is also so wonderful to realize that the work of redemption is complete. There's nothing more that has to be done to make it function other than simply believing it. And of course something else that I think is very important is when you come to know Christ and you begin to grow in Him, you find purpose. Purpose in existence. Purpose in, in, in everything. You go to the store and there are people there that you rub shoulders with that you have opportunities just all over the place. And that is a, I think, just a, a wonderful thing. We um, uh, have developed terminology that I think is kind of interesting. Uh, you don't think of it as, as being biblical, but I think that it probably is. Uh, one thing, if you, if you make a comment, somebody will say, awesome. You ever heard that? Awesome. Do they really mean that? Do they mean this is awesome or do they mean it's awesome? You know, I, I never know exactly what they mean, but it's a term that, that kind of a cliche, really, that, that, that people use. Here's another one. You make a comment and they say, cool. <clears throat> to me, cool means just one degree warmer than cold. But that's not, what they, that's not what they're talking about. They mean, boy, this is a neat thing. That was another one we used to hear, neato. Remember that? Neato. Far out. There's another one. You know, I asked Trey, and he's just old enough. He didn't remember anything. He just, you know, he's, he's getting over the hill. Uh, far out. That's another one. Well, you know, you don't really think about uh, uh, biblical characters as, as using any of those cliches, and, and I don't think they really do, but they do. There are certain terms that, uh, that we find in their, in their writings that are... Uh, are interesting. For example, if you read uh, some of the writings of Paul, I'm thinking particularly of the Philippians, the letter to the Philippians. It was joy and rejoice. Over and over again, rejoice. And again I say rejoice. And I used to always wonder how he could say rejoice. Paul was in prison. I don't think that sounds very rejoicing, do you? But that's where he was. And, and still over and over he said uh, rejoice. Well, the apostle Peter uses a word that we almost don't hear anymore, but it's repeated quite a number of times, and that is the word precious. Precious. Uh, do you use that word often, anybody? How do you use it? Catherine, how do you use it? Okay, you say precious beloved. Do you, do you call the man by you uh, precious? Well, <laughs> it, it would be nice if he did, if, he did, if you don't. <laughs> Uh, the word precious simply carries the idea of, of profound intrinsic value, just something very, very, very important, something wonderful. And as we look into the, the writing of Peter, the Apostle Peter, uh, he uses that word uh, a number of times, and uh, each time he uses it is just a, such an expose of, the, uh, of Christian experience. And I, you know, I've thought so often, Christian experience is so varied. It's so varied. 
Uh, there are those who want to make Christian experience well. You receive Christ and then you, then you start going to church and then you start carrying a Bible and then you stop smoking and drinking and then you stop uh, cussing and, you know, and, and your, your Christian experience is just so stiff <laughs> and so formal and so meaningless. I've said so many times and I believe that Christian experience indeed is meat and potatoes and gravy. It's down home stuff. It's where we live, isn't it? We experience our, our Christianity, our relationship with God on the job, in the school, uh, in the backyard, planting whatever we plant in the backyard, all kinds of things. Well, the Apostle Peter writes, and in 1 Peter chapter 1, and you might want to turn, we're going to be pretty much in the books of First and Second Peter. First Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, we read this. You know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition of your, from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Now, the, the, the blood of Christ is a precious thing. Why? Why would Peter say this is such a precious thing other than there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved apart from through the accomplishments of Jesus Christ? And so he says, as he looks at it, he says, this is a, this is a, a precious thing, profoundly great intrinsic value. There is nothing to compare Anywhere else, in uh, verse 23 of chapter 1 of 1 Peter, he speaks about being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which abides forever. So, you know, it is such a thrilling thing as you really stop and think about it. Christianity is a done deal. All you do is you just come in and you lay hold of it by faith. God said it. That settles it, and we believe it, and then we begin to find it functioning in our lives. And the, the older you get, the more you, you realize how precious uh, he really is. I received a letter from a friend of mine uh, just a couple of days ago. A young, well, she was young when I knew her 50 years ago. <laughs> uh, she, she wrote, and, and she spoke about the fact that we had led her to Christ back 50 years ago in a little town in Colorado up in Ridgeway. And uh, uh, what, a, what a, an interesting life it had been because she was a teenager. She grew up. She went graduated from high school. She went off to college. She went to Guatemala for, uh, uh, with Wycliffe Bible translators and was there for, oh, a number of years. In fact, that's maybe some of you, maybe do any of you remember when I went down to Guatemala? No, some of you do, okay, well it was to see Joy and Don and it was just a, a, a wonderful thing but she said what a precious thing it was to, to reflect on those years the way that God had just manifested himself. You know, we tend to sell him so short. We, we just tend to think that Christianity is, is just so ho-hum and it isn't. It is just such a blessed thing to uh, to really begin to understand what it really is. And I think the other evening, I think it was last Sunday night, we were speaking about the fact that there was a time when Jesus began to speak to uh, the disciples and to the, to the people that were, were gathered. And he spoke of, of some of the uh, difficult things to grasp. He said, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. Well, the, some of the old Jewish people just, you know, really, what do you think, we are cannibals? They, they, they just couldn't understand it. And so they began to just kind of disappear into the woodwork. And Jesus turned to, his, to the disciples and said, well, are you going to go away also? Are you going to leave also? And they said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of everlasting life. There's no other place to go. Tell me, is the blood of Jesus Christ precious or not? Is he a precious Savior or is he just a, another uh, ho-hum experience? Not at all, no. 
He is a precious, precious person, the precious person, but it's his blood that is uh, the cleansing uh, for you and me. Then I, I also turn over to uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, and if you have your Bible, I invite you to do that with me. The 2 Peter chapter 1, and here the apostle begins by writing and saying, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have, have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Is your faith precious? Is faith a precious thing? Sometimes we, we I, it seems at least, maybe sometimes for just me, but sometimes it seems like, like uh, faith is such a hop along Cassidy sort of a thing. We just kind of hop along, yeah, we chew our gum and we talk about faith. And it's, it's not a real uh, issue with this. It's not a real practical part of our experience. Well, I ask you, uh, in the times of Peter, in the, during the days of the apostles, was faith a precious thing? Well, I wouldn't think it would be because it was the means whereby many of them were put to death. They were scattered all over the country because they, uh, Jesus Christ was hated then, just as he is hated in many areas today. And so you say, what was precious about faith? If, if, if it was a, a precious thing, you would think that, that it would have made life smooth and, and rosy without a problem, when just the opposite was true. Faith in Jesus Christ is not, when you become a Christian, when you place your faith in Christ, you are not winning a popularity contest. Did you know that? You really are not. It is not a popular thing. And as the days come and go, it is going to be increasingly non-popular to know Jesus Christ. But to know him is life. Is life. Men, we say, isn't everybody living? No, no. Most people are existing. I believe most people are just existing. They get up in the morning and they, they drink their cup of coffee or their insure or whatever they drink for breakfast and off they go to work and they work all day and they come home at night and they're tired and they uh, have dinner and, and watch the tube a little bit and off they trot to bed and the next day it's the same old thing, same old, same old, same old existence. Jesus said, I'm the company that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. And this is exactly what God wants us to have. And this is what Peter was beginning to understand. Now prior, the early days of Peter, e even in fact the early days of his relationship with, with Jesus Christ, much of Peter's life was that way. And then through the experiences of the crucifixion and all that took place there, Peter came to realize what a precious thing it was to have a friend like Jesus Christ, to someone that sticks closer than a brother, to someone that understands, to someone that cares. Today, I think we are living in very perilous times. Do you? I think they're very perilous times. Everywhere you, everywhere you look, the, the, the world is overrunning with wars and rumors of wars and missiles and heaven knows what and people are dying on, on every corner of the earth. And as we compare prophecy with prophecy and the things that we're seeing in the scripture, we tend to realize that, that as far as the time clock is concerned, it must be about midnight, or just almost midnight, almost time for Jesus Christ to come back. And you know, there's a sense in which I long for it. Uh, I heard a song, what was the song I heard? The hills of home are calling me. Well, you know, the older I get and the tireder I get, <laughs> the more the hills of home seem inviting. But you know, to many, to many, to come to the end of the road of this life is a tragedy, a frightening thing. Or as we think about the things that are going to take place as Jesus comes and as the Antichrist is set up here on this earth and as Satan has his run on things for seven years, it is going to be a tragedy. Tell me this, 
Is it a, a precious thing to say, I know whom I have believed and that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him. Is that precious to you? Believe me, it is precious to me to just realize that my faith has found a resting place and it's in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And, and Peter said, yes, indeed. He says, it is, a, it is a precious thing, a precious thing. Well, there's more. Second Peter chapter 1, Second Peter chapter 1, we read this. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust escaping the corruption of the world in itself makes the promises of God a precious thing. I don't march to the same drumbeat that I hear out there. Do you? I see what's going on. I see the hopelessness in the eyes and hearts of many. And I realize that the God who cannot lie, Titus tells us that, the God who cannot lie has given us exceeding great and precious promises that by these we become partakers of the divine nature. Now we, be, we do not become little gods, nothing of that nature, but his life begins to flow in my veins and I realize, I realize in a new way that this world is not my home. You know, it really isn't. And the man is so blessed when he has come, when he comes to that place of, you know, enjoy all that there is. And there's a lot to enjoy. Appreciate it and enjoy it. But don't put your roots down too deeply because this world is not our home. And frankly, I'm delighted to know that. How about you? So uh, God has given us exceeding great and precious promises that by these we might become partakers of the divine nature uh, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. When we think of lust we so often think of immorality per se and of course it includes that but I, I, I think about what I see today the lust for notoriety, the lust for power, man's lust to be, to be recognized, to be top dog, the lust to be something special, to be noticed. You know, really, all of this is so fleeting. Years ago, someone said, learn to hold loosely everything that is not eternal. And I think there is wisdom in that. Learn to hold loosely everything that is not eternal. Counting on the promises of God. And you know, and I have to tell you this, when I was in college, Dr. Harry Stamm, missionary to the Congo, Belgian Congo for years and years and years, one of the, one of the finest gentlemen, missionary men that I have ever known, but he used to say something like this. He would say, and he was an old man. He was probably my age by then. This was 55, 60 years ago. He would say, you know, the, the, the longer that I walk with God, the more I realize my total dependence upon him. And I remember thinking, Dr. Stan, why do you say that? You've been a missionary for years. You have a, he was back at college and he had a, a daily a broadcast and, and everybody loved him and he was desired to have him speak at conferences and all of it. Why do you say that? Well, I think the reason was because he realized uh, the Word of God and he began, the older you get, the more you deal in, in the realm of realities. And so often we don't. So often, I think the younger generation perhaps more, although maybe I should be careful even saying that, but sometimes we 
we live, we, you know, we drive bigger cars than we can afford, we live in bigger houses than we can afford, we dress in fancier clothes than we can afford, and all these things. We, we put on a, a, a demonstration. We don't deal with reality. And of course, a part of our problem today is that some of us are happy to deal with reality right now. And it's, it's not a fun thing, and I'm sure that uh, we're all aware of that. But anyway, uh, the uh, precious promises that, that God has given us are so wonderful, and he cannot lie. But there's one more that I want to share with you, and uh, I don't think you're going to like this one. And I, I really don't care for it either. First Peter chapter 1. And we turn to verses 6 and 7. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations or testings, that the trial of your faith, that the what? That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. The trial of our faith, what is its purpose? What, what is accomplished by, by running me through these, through these trials, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, facing some of the hard things that I face? And, and I think every one of us has. I believe every one of us faces all kinds of testings, all kinds of trials. Uh, they're not all the same, of course, but, but we face them. But it's, it's as I said, a, a refining process. Uh, and again, I, I used to live in mining area uh, where gold was mined. And I've been in some of these mines and I've seen the stuff that comes out of the gold mines doesn't look like gold to me. It looks just like old gray rock, and I can't imagine there being any value to it. But they take that, that gold in, in the rock, and they grind it, and they do all kinds of acid treatments and so on. They, they put it through times of testing or trial, and the, 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 the slag comes off, and it leaves something shining that is very, very value, valuable and that is gold. And you know, sometimes we, th we look at our, at, or I have, uh, sometimes we look at our, uh, our Christian life and it, it doesn't seem very valuable. Sometimes it's kind of something we endure. Now, I'm not talking about it all the time, but I'm just talking about periodically when it just seems like something that, 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 that we endure. And then God lets us go into a time of trial, a time of hurt, a time of heartache. Have you ever been there? Have you ever had your heart just really, really wrenched, really broken? Well, it happens. And when that happens, you find yourself in, in, a, in a wasteland, in a, a desert, and you say, oh, what am I going to do? How can I face these things? Somewhere along the line, the Spirit of God grabs hold of you and reminds you that you're complete in Christ, reminds you that having begun a good work in you, he is in the process of performing and perfecting it in your life. Somewhere along the line, we begin to realize that God is absolutely faithful. And listen to this. God's faithfulness is not dependent upon your faithfulness. Did you know that? Let me say that again. God's faithfulness is not dependent upon your faithfulness. If it was, look at Peter. We'd have kicked him out a long time ago, wouldn't we? <laughs> After all the, the time that Peter the apostle had had with the Lord and all the wonderful fellowship and all the, the instruction and everything else, for Peter to curse and swear and in the presence of unbelievers say, I don't even know who you're talking about. I don't even know who he is. And then after the resurrection, 
Jesus said, go and tell my disciples. Don't forget to tell Peter. <laughs> don't forget to tell Peter because Peter very probably thinks that, that, that I don't care anymore. You see, there's so many things we don't realize about these, these writers of the New Testament. They were, they were not so smart. It was just that God was speaking through them. That's all. And so Peter needed to learn that, that uh, God's faithfulness is not dependent upon Peter's faithfulness. What a blessing that was. And the writings of Peter are some of the most profound and wonderfully blessed areas of biblical truth that I know. Written by a man who knew heartache, who certainly felt that he had absolutely devastated any possibility of a relationship with the Savior after, after cursing and swearing and, and denying that, you, that he even knew him. Well, the apostle uses these words, uh, precious, and they're words that, that I don't think probably we use them a lot today. I have a, a few friends that, well, I have many friends and many acquaintances, but, but some are very special I mean special, special, and I may say, you know, your, your friendship is very precious to me. And by that I mean it's, it's, it's beyond acquaintance. It's beyond that. And you know, my relationship to God is totally based on His faithfulness. But the older I get, the more I realize He is exceedingly precious to me. I can't imagine, I can't imagine being where I am, nearly 78 years old, being where I am with no direction, no understanding, no insight as to what happens next. When my heart stops beating, what then? Is that it? Well, yeah, I think so. Really? Well, what's your, what's your authority? Well, I don't really have any. That's a problem. My authority is Jesus Christ. And his word, mark this down. The great percentage of the word of God is not only true, it is provably true. Provably true historically, archaeologically, uh, in every way, scientifically. Now, it's not a book of science, but when it speaks of the scientific, it is totally accurate. And no scientist, with all of their wisdom, have ever been able to, to disprove the Word of God. Precious, yes. And then, of course, when it's all said and done, the Scripture says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. So when it's all over, when it's all done, and I'm home, he says it's precious. And you know what? I think I'm going to say, Lord, I think it's precious too. It's precious to me too. Let's bow together, shall we? Our Father and our God, we are so grateful tonight for your word. It is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. We know that. And our Father, we simply ask that the, the, the profound qualities of, of life in Christ might become exceedingly visible to each one here. God, just to expose to us that something of the magnitude of what has taken place at Calvary in our behalf. And so, our God, we just continue to commit what we are to you. And Lord, just now as we conclude this time together, I pray for Pastor Chapel. I don't know where he is, but I'm sure of this. I'm sure that he's very tired. And so, our God, I just ask you to, in Jesus' name, to touch his body and to give him the strength and the, the spiritual and physical nourishment that he needs to pick up and uh, carry the torch. Our Father, I thank you for all you are to us in Jesus' name.